just okay. just right despite despite um you know chatting and emailing and doing all kinds of stuff but i can get on with you know with facebook you can sign in with facebook i don't i don't ever want to link my accounts i will always use my yeah at my email address and a password but that was very weird so i'm i'm don't don't call me paranoid <laughs> <laughs> just because yeah just because you're not paranoid doesn't mean nobody's chasing you exactly <laughs> speaking, um, speaking of that i happened to watch just as we're chatting um because i i was up in the middle of the night remember the the last warren Beatty movie uh bullworth yes vaguely i watched it last night in the middle of the night and it's it's very prophetic and really interesting that um, that that was his swan song in terms of movie making. Mm -hmm. It was twenty five years ago, mm -hmm. and it's about a presidential candidate. Blah blah blah, right? Well, it's about a senatorial candidate in California who um, whose brain gets scrambled, and he adopts kind of a a, a, a bit of a, a rapper um, persona, and he just starts telling the truth about the about politics and about you know all the shenanigans that go on and and that was his campaign and all of a sudden he was extremely popular mm -hmm. yep sort of a combination of mccain and donald trump yep and, and <laughs> vladimir Zelensky. good point yeah uh, who actually ran that plot straight to the presidency so well, well but wait but uh bullworth was telling the truth i don't know that mr trump is quite doing that well he <laughs> It's, again, it's, it's the well, appearance of straight shooting is yeah. all. Yeah. So what's what's really weird is that mixed into Trump's bullshit is some truth that nobody else will say. So Trump yeah. is the only politician I know, only major one who said that Bush Jr. took us into the wrong war in Iraq, and and he criticized him for that. And it's like no Republican and no Democrat particularly will do that. I thought that was like very interesting because the pro the problem with abusive relationships is that it's 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 this it's like there, there's an attractive part and there's the horrible part yeah and they're mixed together and and sometimes they're hard to disambiguate and in trump's case i don't think it's that, that and, hard to disambiguate. And propaganda and disinformation work best when at least 50 percent of what's being said is true or at least some people a lot of people believe it's true i mean that's it's, it's like derivatives in the global financial crisis. They they basically took a bunch of good mortgages and then increasing it turned up the volume on the crap mortgages they poured into them until the whole system came down. Yeah. And then the government came, came in and bailed out and put patches on everything because nobody wanted it to completely fall apart on their watch, even though the foundation was not there. Mm -hmm. Well, let's be clear. The government came in and patched it up means that we, the taxpayers, <laughs> spent more money for the folks who are holding the brains. Right. Okay. That is known as the Greenspan put. Yeah. Uh huh. We got a lot of money back, actually, as I recall. I mean, I think the we did. What was the investment? We did. The investment was actually I mean, a lot of the banks that we bailed out ended up giving the U.S. government a pretty good return. Huh. I don't know what the total balance sheet was, but there there were a number of fire sales where. The U.S. and the Federal Reserve came in, and yeah. they did. They did get paid back. It would be interesting to see the ROI on that. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to know what you um, uh, count. You know, which part of it do you count? And I, I do. I do know one thing: the COVID crisis generated like half a trillion dollars in loans, most of which went to people who didn't need them. They were forgivable loans, and um, somehow they all got forgiven. But the, it was funny. The people who were who needed it most, of course, couldn't get it. So, what other things are in people's hearts and minds today that we might choose as a topic to head into? We don't need to talk about <clears throat> uh, corruption in government or other kinds of things like that. Um, any any offers, Mike? <laughs> Maybe it's just because I have computer security on my mind, but. Um... I think it was Newsweek that had a really good article on how the Chinese really probably are going to have their chips and software in almost everything, including our critical infrastructure, and whether there's anything we can do about it. 
I mean, it, it, it's clear that the U.S. has taken advantage of this for at least 10 or 25, at least 20 or 25 years. Um, clearly, Microsoft and other tools were being used by foreign governments, and uh, we knew how, how to compromise those. And in some cases, the stories have come out. But I, I just, this is, it may, this may not be the crowd to, to worry about it, but this is just, it's a fundamental problem. The, the hardware that the whole digital economy, the whole economy is based on, has things that have bugs that are being exploited. And I, I don't know, I, I know what we're doing is not working. I don't know if there is a solution. But maybe I'm the only one. I mean, I, 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 I sometimes have to, you know, stop to thinking about global warming and find another uh, crisis to deal with. And I'm not sure this is a crowd that has enough sort of background or depth or or focus on on the cybersecurity uh, issue. Uh, it 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 is important, but I don't see any nodding heads. So maybe yeah. um, Doug, go ahead. Okay, it's not a topic, but it's something that I want to say, so I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, yeah. I think it's almost mandatory that everybody read uh, Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. The detail about how people react to decline is amazing. Uh, and it's also just really interesting to read. And Rome was a much more complicated society than we get taught. Um, the the key takeaway for me in the third that I've read so far is that when there's nothing for people to do to improve the situation, they fall back on power struggles that lead to assassinations and mo local mafias everywhere. Uh, and I think that's a warning to us. And the book is just fabulous. It just ought to be part of everybody's education. And for everybody who wants to learn to write sentences that are a page long, it's like the tutorial. Yeah, but they're they're great sentences. Yeah. Um, so interesting. Thank you. And and there's an audio version uh, that's 136 hours. Oh. But that's not intimidating because every piece of it is worth listening to. It doesn't matter where you come in. And it's in Latin, but that's never a problem. <laughs> um. Any, uh, who has read uh, History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire? Anybody? Doug has. Doug is going back in for the reread. None of the rest of us have read it. Has ever I've, read, read? I've, read, I've read the highlights. I mean, it's huh? certainly... I, Did you I, the, I, the Cliff's Notes? No, not the Cliff Notes. There's actually a well-organized 100-page highlights. It's, it's, uh -huh. it, was, it, was, it was a good thing to read. What the highlights miss, it, it, it pushes to the order of events. This happened and then that happened. Yeah. The original is great because it's the texture of how people reacted and felt with each other. Uh, it reads much more like a novel, but the, the uh, detail is very refreshing. What strikes me a lot when thinking about history or reading some histories is that you look back at any stretch of history and some empires last a long time, some are pretty short, but any like 10 year stretch has all the intrigue and backstabbing and soap opera-ness of, of every other decade in, in human history. It's like there is texture everywhere. Um, and sometimes it's recorded and sometimes we lose it and we don't know what happened. And it's just like, there's just this big bank of fog. Um, but there's, there's, there's intrigue and politics all the time in most places, I think. And, um, and humans tend to be humans a lot. So the topic could be, how do cultures decline? We could head toward that. Um, I've got another funny issue. And yeah. again, maybe this is not the right group, but um, most of the geopolitics that we read about focuses on the big powers, right? US, China. European Union, sometimes we talk about Japan. But more and more small little countries can do crazy stuff, both good stuff and bad stuff. And so I, again, I, I, this group may not care or may not have good examples, but uh, any thought on what the new order will be as we determine how 
to get people in every country working together. I, I've actually I've been toying with the idea of writing to the Secretary General of the UN. I, I think I mentioned this. They're requesting visions, ideas on visions for the UN. They're going to have a summit for the future <laughs> next, next year. And this is actually driving some serious talk about how would you rearrange the United Nations? So my crazy headline would be, United Nations, question mark, no. United people, yes. And so create a way to actually give individuals so that the UN would not be in the business of empowering governments and and being stalemated all the time yeah. because they can't get 193 countries to agree. But instead, somehow it's a, 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 a promoter of decentralized people power. But anyway, another crazy idea. I'm, I, no, again. I actually like that idea because, uh, Mike, as you were talking earlier about um, um, fear of China, you know, being, you know, interspersed in technology, my immediate thought in response to that was um, hmm, we need more global governance and not and not reliance on nation state organization, which doesn't seem to be working in this era of global challenges. So I think you're you're on to something right now in terms of a reorganization of you know how we govern the planet. And 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 if you think about the the latest votes on abortion in various states in the US when um the people you know, uh, 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 you know, were victorious over what the politicians wanted to do uh, because they felt some fundamental right was taken away. So I think you're 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 pushing in the right direction. And when you say, you know, UN, uh, I say do something. You know, <laughs> and 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 they can't they can't do something because the original organization hands are tied. I mean, think about this. Russia invades another country and they're still on the Security Council with veto power. It's nuts. It's it a, it's absolutely nuts. But the idea of leaving it up to people is a, is a, is a great idea. Mm -hmm. um, Gil, Gil, has, and the, Gil and the, has kindly had his hand up for a bit. Right. Um, United Nations is real important in ways that we that Americans don't understand. Um, you know, there's an anti-UN current in this country that blinds us to how significant it is in the rest of the world and how, how how seriously the rest of the world takes it so mike uh, go for it um I, jerry on the idea of talking about how civilizations decline two thoughts one is well yeah i guess two one is that um it'd be interesting to talk about how they emerge or rise also um because um, there's displacement involved in the decline but um I would suggest that rather than us just having a free for all conversation about that, that we do some homework before having that kind of conversation. Uh, and it might be that we identify, you know, a half a dozen works like Gibbons and others uh, that are salient. And each of us do, each of us volunteer to do a very quick digest of each of them. And we come back and do a little five minute university version of 30 minutes of briefing of these half a dozen works that we've read and then start to discuss. Um, that sounds like a good approach, Gil. Also, uh, Pete led a book club for multiple weeks about the dawn of everything, mm -hmm. uh, Graeber and Wengro's book, which has a lot of information on this topic. Mm -hmm. uh, there are probably other people who've read uh, um, Jerry Diamond and others on, on the topic. So that uh, sure. so maybe yeah. what we do is we set this up for two weeks from now and we say, let's all do some homework. Does that sound yeah. reasonable? Yeah, and I've just been reading Meg Wheatley's, uh, I think it's her last latest book of Who Do We Choose to Be, uh, which has a section that does a summary of a, of a bunch of different civilization decline theories, looking for the patterns that repeat. Um, and, um, you know, <laughs> it's it's a sobering read because some of it sounds very familiar to now. Thanks. I, I, li I like your suggestion a lot. Um, my small riff on this trope is uh, something I call big G versus little g. Uh, which is governments versus governance. And I'm a big fan of governance, and I'm just not a huge fan of governments. I think that governments really mess things up. And as soon as you get enough power to have a standing army and do a bunch of other stuff, then you can then you can perpetuate all kinds of things on your neighbors and things go downhill from there. 
Um, so I don't know. I, I'm a skeptic. I like I like maybe for our um, proposed call in a couple of weeks, not just to talk about the rise and fall of empires, but this this question about what would you do about the United Nations? How would you rethink the UN? Is a really interesting question to me. Like what, <clears throat> and it doesn't need to be focused on the United Nations. But um, is there such a thing as global governance? Might there be something like that? Could be part of the mix of our question. Doug? Yeah, another way to frame what the question might be is the following. Who will do what and when will they do it? What do you mean by that? Well, uh, in this miasma that we're in where nobody can act, is somebody finally going to act? Who are they and what will they do? The thing that triggered my thoughts about this topic was a new book called Outlaw Ocean. And it's all about the lawless zone that starts 200 miles off most countries. A lot of it is about the brutality uh, and slavery on a lot of fishing vessels, particularly Chinese fishing vessels. But the one that, the chapter that caught my attention was about the Republic of Sealand. Hmm. How many people know about the Republic of Sealand? It was a um, uh, anti-aircraft gunning platform built in the middle of the uh, um, uh, English Channel. And critically, it was seven miles offshore. And in the 60s, when your jurisdiction reached only three miles offshore, some creative Brit went out there and claimed this rusty old platform from the 1940s as his property and his country. And he gave this country to his wife as a present and then set up a pirate radio station. And for more than 50 years, it's been this mythological pseudo country that has hosted pornography on servers. It's handed out bogus passports, often to very unscrupulous people, who, um, or, or in some cases, people have sold these bogus passports to people who didn't realize Sealand was not a country. But this whole idea that, you know, you, you can sort of create a country if you wish, and, and the Brits have had a hard time knowing what to do with this thing. There's a very funny movie um, called The Boat That Rocked, which was uh, re renamed as Pirate Radio here because we didn't know much about the history of British Pirate Radio. Uh, it's got Philip Seymour Hoffman, uh, Bill Nye is a crazy ass person in it, Kenneth Branagh, uh, it's a bunch of, bunch of people. It's very funny um, and worth a, worth a viewing. Uh, and then there's a whole question of micronations, of which there are many. Uh, there are sort of disputed territories. There's a lot of interesting uh, things there. And then back a little earlier to when small countries do interesting things, uh, my favorite things I point to are Portugal, which illegalized drugs back some 20 years ago and has done really interesting work around that and changed their statistics dramatically. Uh, Estonia, which regained its nationhood uh, after the fall of the Iron Curtain and then decided to go full electronic and has a pap basically paperless government that it's also marketing to other countries as X road, I think, uh, and, and other things. And I think that there's, there's really spots of brilliance around the world and how we, how we align ourselves up to do things. So I'm, I'm eager to collect up stories like that as well. Um, and then there's slavery. Sorry, I'm just looking at the chat. Um, all too sobering. And, and once you're in international waters and you've got somebody, you've taken somebody's passport away or whatever, their only hope is to jump ship when they're near a port or something like that and cross their fingers. I don't know, it's, it's terrible. It's just terrible. So uh, what topic would we like to talk about today? Maybe somebody has a happy topic to talk yeah. about. Well, and that, that would not be out of our reach. I was thinking of proposing that we talk about, I mean, I, I talk about the mental health crisis among the 12-year-old to 25-year-old cohort. That uh, seems cheerful. Well, flip it around and uh, 
ask the question, you know, what, what joyful things are people in that age group doing? Uh, some of it is a counter to the depression, but I, I have too many uh, relatives who seem to just be in a constant state of anxiety and 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 because they're much more frank about it, they they they're they're happy to talk to prospective employers about the medications they're on, and it, it's it, it's quite fascinating. Um, but it it does uh, the numbers are huge. I, I've seen everywhere from you know twenty to thirty five percent of our uh, high school students are diagnosed as having anxiety or depression or something at some point. <laughs> So that doesn't seem like too happy a topic. Well, as I say, let, let's look at the tw two thirds who aren't depressed. You know, and, 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 and what they are doing is pretty incredible. I mean, you have all these kids yeah. organizing startups and music. Jerry? So, so let me. Yeah. So here, hold on one, one second, Stuart. I'll pass it back to you in a second. But I, I would love a call, and this would probably take a little homework or something from us as well. But um, Lizzie Nelson helped us learn about DFTBA, and this is the uh, gang sign for nerd fighters. Uh, DFTBA means don't forget to be awesome. There are there are cohorts cohorts of very young people who are doing astonishing stuff in the world and learning things and building community and so forth. I would love to know more about where they are, what they're doing, and how how those like communities are, are are working, and whether they're optimistic or pessimistic or whatever. So that that might be another place, and we could have a couple of people who know come in and join us as guests. Uh, Mike has frozen my on my screen, but everybody else is moving, so I think it's not me. It might be Mike, and I'm bummed because I was gonna see what Mike had to say about that. Well, no, I'm I'm audible, oh, not seeable. Good. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure why this is happening, but um, yeah, it would be fun to kind of do a revisit. Um, you know, I think when Lizzie met with you and the, for the first time, it was uh, more than 10 years ago. And uh, there, there were some pretty exciting things that were going on. Hank Green and his brother um, were doing Hank these and John Green, the Blog Brothers. Yep. And um, yeah, they, they had a lot of good wholesome books as well that, you know, that were creating a, a real following. I mean, I, I went with her to a hotel ballroom here in Washington and 800 kids, junior high and high school were sitting there waiting to get their books signed. That's amazing. And then I'm Hank and John Green are still my heroes. They, they, they just do phenomenal stuff. Stuart, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, no worries. So I, I was just going to, um, in some ways, um, was building on 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 Mike in the sense that if I was coming of age today, um, I'd probably just want to go back to sleep, which is some form of anxiety, you know, if you're paying attention to the media. But but building on that a little bit, um, uh, on the death of Robbie Robertson, um, I watched a, a short video that he championed, which was um, an international rendering of um, Take the Weight Off, uh, which he did with entertainers from all around the world. And I've been fascinated, you know, we, we talk a lot about the need for mass levels of transformation at a human level to as the only way for a foundation to really um, shift people into doing things like regenerative uh, agriculture. Uh, how can we use mass media where so many entertainers, uh, filmmakers, singers are activists in this area? And, and how might we use that as a, as a great fulcrum to wake more and more people up? Um, you know, we've done it in the past. Think about We the World. Um, how can we actually tap into the incredible um, power of that medium, um, you know, the antithesis of that being all the the violence uh, and depravity uh, that is skewed in the media. So, just just a a long winded thought. I don't know. Uh, you know, I think there's a topic in there of some kind. Maybe maybe you heard something, Jerry. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So, should Taylor Swift's next tour be the New Era's tour? <laughs> and, 
And I mean, talking about the Eros tour for a bit was interesting as well, because it is a major cultural phenomenon right happening right this minute. Uh, and she's just ra just wrapping up the U.S. tour and about to go international. She won't be done until next year. Uh, it's an astonishing thing, even if it's just a concert uh, by one singer, songwriter. It's quite amazing. Um, Apparently, it kept the Swedish economy out of recession. Yep. Really? Well, uh, they're calling it Swiftonomics, and it's having a major bump for cities. Cities love to have uh concerts in their stadiums because she brings a huge economic benefit i don't know what huge is but um it's a bump it's a noticeable bump just Did people notice up. her her bonus strategy which is what do you mean uh often at the end of tours artists will give their crew you know five or ten thousand dollar bonuses uh, she gave her crew hundred thousand dollar bonuses fifth to fifty five people like you know described as life-changing for these folks kind of stunning i was going to go a little bit further in steward and say i i think the media is what's driving the chinese innovation push if you watch chinese media it looks a lot like american media in the early 60s you know, they were they're celebrating their astronauts uh, you know we had cartoons about the jetsons and the you know the future uh, and it wasn't Futurama. <laughs> it was a very pessimistic or uh, pessimist, a very optimistic world. And the Chinese, are, you know, they don't they don't celebrate their basketball players nearly as much as they celebrate their chemists and engineers. And it's a conscious decision. Um, and they and they obviously are censoring a whole lot of things that uh, make the government look bad and make people depressed. Yeah. <laughs> So give me credit for that new word I just uh, invented. <laughs> it is kind of what I am. I'm optimi <laughs> optimistic about the technology and pessimistic about the politicians. Quick, register that. Yeah. Um, uh, anyone feel that 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 there are sort of other interesting meanings in the the Eras tour, in in sort of this. There's a bunch of writings about how concerts are back. There's another bunch of articles about the economics of it. There's a bunch of articles about Taylor and her relationship with fans and what's going on there. There's a, a whole comets trail of interesting things being said. And it may just be that it's a it's just a big media event. Um, but it might be more. And, and I'm I'm really interested in the question I guess Stuart posed, which is like there's a nice long history of artists um, generating social events that mattered at least that seemed to have mattered and at large scale it looks like farm aid and uh, a bunch of other sorts of things big concerts but at small scale there's a there's an albino singer songwriter from west africa who wrote songs about social issues in his country i'm forgetting exactly who it was um, but but his songs became really popular hits and transmitted knowledge there's there's a bunch of didactic songs that get popular uh, so that this doesn't need to be big money uh money spending events but rather uh social transmission of ideas as well yeah i mean and i think the question could be um for discussion you know how do we how do we um leverage that into something positive how do we how do we leverage you know the power of that into something positive today for 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 the, the time that we're in right now one of the really cool things about the Vlog Brothers is that they are all about trying to help their followers do positive things in the world. And I kind of wish Taylor Swift were more like that. And because of the power she wields and the connection she has and all of that. And she's basically telling the story of her life and relationships and yeah. in, a, in a very relatable way. Um, so, so she's a kid. <laughs> and she's doing too, I think. So well, yeah, but she's still she she's still, I think, coming of age. And you know, this is what she's been focused on. At some point in time, that's going to shift to a broader, you know, focus on the artists that are that are already thinking um in that way. Mm -hmm. You know, the the um 
the, the folks that you just mentioned, the Jackson Browns of the world, who are like, you know, modern day prophets um, in terms of the, the messaging in their concerts, that's just extraordinary. Um, you know, Bob Dylan did that when he was 14. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Unfortunately, the messaging to, to young people is still confused. There just was an article coming through this morning where Florida is now showing kids uh, uh, videos or movies that are basically climate change denial, right? Uh, uh, so, so yeah, I mean, what do you think for an 80 or 10 year old kid getting a video like this and then listening to multiple perspectives? I mean, it's a mess, right? For as long as we are circling uh, uh, with with uh, uh, this this misinformation, it doesn't go very far. And also, this goes back a bit to governments and governance. But the idea that you can control that everybody gets put into large schools where there's school boards and others who decide what gets shown and not shown, and everybody has to hew to a curriculum, really rubs me wrong. Anyway. Um, but it, it creates the conditions and the situations for the battles we're seeing uh, in legislations and school boards and other kinds of places. Yeah, that was the that, that was one of the most interesting things about the the article the class just mentioned, which I put in the listserv this morning, is that in the article it actually called uh, everyone advocating climate science Nazis. <laughs> Good lord. <laughs> That's what it did in the vid and in the video. In the, in the video. video. Yep. Yeah. Uh-huh. That the Nazis are trying to get you. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is well, really absurd when you think about it, right? This well, is this is so over the top crazy stuff. That's what that's what literally happened in Germany in the 1930s. Now yeah. right, where these exaggerated ex extreme comments which are becoming normalized somehow. I mean think about 10 years ago to to come across a comment like this you would have you know right now it's just yeah here's another one it's really interesting that putin's claim on launching this latest offensive into ukraine was denazification and that and that and that calling people that is sort of the ultimate it's like it's it's the uh it's the atomic weapon of discourse in some sense. Uh, it's the, the Godwin uh, rule, which is like any conversation eventually degenerates into, into citing the Nazis. Um, and it's a sign that something has gone wrong. It's a sign that the discourse is broken somewhere, somehow, no? Just an observation about our discussion. Mm -hmm. okay. We are we are a wonderful microcosm of the poly crisis. <laughs> we keep hopping from one major crisis to another because there's so much shit to, to wrap to try to wrap your head around, and it's almost impossible to do. <laughs> well, I had the I had the image moments ago. It's funny, Stuart. I had the image moments ago of sort of like Chinese New Year when there's a dragon chasing a pearl as a as a parade. And that that pearl is the topic we're sort of looking for in this conversation. And we're just like in the dragon doing the thing. And I, I it wasn't unpleasant. It was like, whoa, OK, we're sort of uh, weaving and winding our way through things. No, but, I, wasn't, I wasn't saying it was unpleasant. I was yeah. just saying it's, you know, here we are. <laughs> we're talking about the poly crisis. And let's let's throw out the other crisis that so many Americans are obsessed with. Does everybody know what the third most popular movie in America is right now after Barbie and Oppenheimer? No. No. I think it's called Voice of Freedom. It's about a former FBI agent who was trying to prevent child trafficking. And it has th themes that look a lot like QAnon and the idea that there's child trafficking and pedophilia everywhere. It's the third most popular movie. Uh, the fascinating thing is that all these people who are accusing Democrats of promoting pedophilia are overlooking the fact that there's been a long list of Republicans who uh, have been convicted, not just accused, but convicted, yeah. thrown to jail. For... Are, you sure that's the, are you sure that's the name of the movie? Because Voice of Freedom is an American Experience episode about civil okay. rights. No, let's let me look it up. Yeah, um, thanks. 
I think you're close. Yeah, I'll put put a note. Thank but, you. Uh, yeah, the uh, one of the biggest don one, uh, major donor to Donald Trump just got thrown in jail for um, being almost as bad as Jeffrey Epstein. I mean, these guys. I mean, there there it seems to be an, a, a a very odd correlation between uh, state Republican officials and child pornography. Wow, is it, it is sound, sound of it freedom? Is, is it sound? Yeah, is it sound it of freedom? Is sound of freedom. It is. It's about child trafficking. But it's it's you know it's a very important topic, and yet it's being used as a as being weaponized. Yeah. As you, and you know Biden is failing to protect the borders from child pornographers, and nobody's talking about the demand side. I mean, yeah. it, it's ruined the lives of you know at least tens of thousands of mostly women every year, and sometimes maybe hundreds of thousands. And it is it's a, it also feeds the tech clash. Right. Um, Sound of Freedom is uh, a, a drama, an over-dramatization of Operation Underground Railroad, which was a real thing about kind of amateurs who went in to try to break up child sex trafficking rings, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and it has Jim Caviezel, who gets into these kinds of movies a lot uh, in the starring role. Uh, very interesting. Doug, sorry, I just noticed you've had your hand up. Okay, uh, I'm wondering what is the ethics of talking about positive things when we basically think things are falling apart and there's no out? Um, I think the simple answer is despair doesn't actually help fix anything and gets everybody like really jammed up and broken. And then we just have more people with mental health crises to deal with. Um, and second, that fixing things can actually be joyful work. Uh, that 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 fixing things is is uplift, is positive, and can be really uh, really nice. Um, uh, that's just my superficial take. Anybody else want to jump in? Just to say that you're exactly right, Jerry. Optimists live longer. Um, and there's ways of uh, so so Doug my. My conundrum, my my the facet of your thicket of problems that I see a lot is like, OMG, humans seem to delay acting on things until it's pretty much too late. <clears throat> We're really good at that. We avoid, avoid, avoid. Nobody wants to do the deep work that that actual dramatic change entails uh, because it's very upset. It turns over too many things that are set and grooved and working and profitable and whatever. Um, so I keep trying to figure out, and, and that's why the question about what if media stars got involved in this, you know, could they help? What if, what if? I'm, I'm interested in all the what ifs, because I think that if we try a thousand things, uh, two of them might actually sort of tip enough that humans start to get together to do things. I'm interested in the big government versus small g governance question as a different facet on the big thorny hairball of poly crises. Because if we manage to do small g governance together and solve problems, we might actually do things in unison, uh, sort of collaboratively, that lend to solving the larger problem. Uh, so so every, every one of the things that's kind of been coming up is a possible answer. None of them seem like an, an easy answer. Anyone else? Ken, you have a thought running through your head, I think. Do you not? I have many thoughts in my head. Yes. You know, I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, but I, I once heard this story that, you know, in the Tour de France, there's still wooden bridges that have the timbers going lengthwise. And so there's spaces between the timbers. And um, people were getting hurt because they were going in, you know, they were derailing, getting into caught in the in the gap. And sports psychologists figured out what they needed to do was aim high, look all the way across the bridge and do not look down, right? And I feel like that's a great metaphor for where we are. There's lots of gaps, lots of things to fall into. And if we look down, we're gonna get, we're just gonna derail, we're gonna go right off the road and, and be harmed. So I'm not saying to ignore the um, the issues, but we need something positive to focus on. We need, we need an aspirational future. And that's what I, I'm struggling with is, Yes, we have a poly crisis, meta crisis, perma crisis, whatever you want to label it all, some combination of all of those or the Venn diagram hits. But without 
an aspirational future without a belief. You know, I, I, Doug, it, it pains me when you say, when we're convinced there's no way out. I'm not convinced there's no way out. I think the way out's going to be really hard. I think it's going to be tremendous suffering. But I still believe that there is a way through. And um, so what is something that can guide us to keep our vision high enough to not get pulled down while at the same time not ignoring the danger and becoming informed by it in ways that allow us to make better assessments about the future? Because I think what happens is you know, we make assessments about the future of it's going to be X or Y or Z, and that determines the actions we take. And we're we're doing that with a, a terrible lack of information. There's no one knows enough to really predict the future. It's way too complex. So, you know, we pay attention to certain trends. And, uh, you know, I'm watching Oliver Stone's Untold History of the United States, which is incredibly depressing. The, the episode on LBJ and the Vietnam War was horrific to watch, to see not just Vietnam, but what LBAJ did around the world to all these countries, the CIA going in and, and deposing governments, democratically elected governments. And then we turn out the United States is the democratic champion of the world. Bullshit. It's amazing to me that we have not been taken in, taken down by, by the people we've screwed over. So how do we balance the fact that, yes, there are really terrible dark things in human character when we we create governance structures that rely on enormous amounts of military might and power we're going to get people who can abuse that is there not another way to organize ourselves because going into the future heavily armed when um when the defense posture is one that is destroying the ecology the the life support systems we have that's bucky fuller called it killing rate you need to invest in living room, you know, and how do you shift? What's Where's the leverage points to get people to recognize if we keep pointing guns at each other, we're eventually going to pull the triggers. And what we need to do is start planting gardens, to use Doug's garden world analogy. It's some of the thoughts in my head. Thank you, Ken. Lots. Um, let's go into silence for just a little bit to process some of where we've been. And then uh, Klaus, if you'll bring us out, we'll go Klaus, then Doug. But uh, just wait a little bit. Yeah, I mean the challenge really is to to lift to lift the eyes up you know, towards the horizon, you know, as uh, Ken just really described so well. Because if you just keep looking down, then then you stumble. Um, and, and and Kevin actually in last week's meeting framed it really well, saying that uh, just look at the action ahead. You know, just look at the next thing you can do and, and don't get disturbed by uh, the perceived hopelessness of uh, what, what uh, you know, may be such an overwhelming task. The challenge really is I'm, I'm just working on um, um, with, with, the, with the Sailor Club trying to, they have all these splinter groups, you know, the vegans, the anti crazers uh, the, the water sentinels. I mean, they're all, you know, you have all these splinter groups working on um, highly technical, very narrowly focused issues. And there is a complete lack of understanding that all of this is connected. You can't change anything that, without changing everything. You know, it's a, these are systemic uh, issues. And um, and it's amazing how how that throws people into a loop because um, what do you mean we have to you know, talk about everything it's, it's it's way too much so to 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 transition you know to to take through this step and say um, there is an outcome here and it takes a lot of little steps to come to this outcome but the outcome is really hopeful positive op op optimistic positive right if we just focus on soil for example then you restore life because you can't fix the soil if you use chemicals 
right? You can't fix the soil if you use monocrops. So you, you, you can't uh, fix the soil if you use pesticides and herbicides and so on. And, and the outcome will be you know, more healthful food, uh, uh, clean water and things like that. But it's, it's, it's a real challenge when, 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 when we are so myopic, focused on you know, what, is, what is in our sphere uh, of, of influence or knowledge and knowing and to just create this bigger picture. But then that bigger picture is constantly being sabotaged, right? I mean, like this article we just mentioned about uh, Florida showing these crazy, you know, distorting uh, videos there to children. Um, so I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying hard to, to you know, pull us back and look, look out, and it seems to work. I've got in, we, we are going, we are sending 30 people to Washington in September, and I'm going to uh, give them you know, sort of a big picture overview of what to talk to with members of Congress to, uh, uh, to, to not get trapped into one bill, you know, and into one myopic issue. But let's talk big picture, you know, the issues that, uh, that, that we're concerned about. But I, I think that's that's just you know half half a, a a garden world vision, right? So to convey that, I think, you know, like the little play that we had in our neo book, you know, and you know, no time to follow up on it. But you know, people are really interested, you know, in wanting to to create a positive message because then you don't have to argue about climate change. You know, we can just talk about the soil. And the, the the microbes inside the soil, it's it's that you know, it's shifting stories into a positivity um, uh, and 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 a an outcome based you know picture, big challenge. Thanks, Lars. I'm looking positively towards something we can do together with people that we might disagree with otherwise. Make, makes a lot of sense to me. Um, Stuart, then Ken, then Doug. Yeah, it seems that, by the way, I'm not trying to look cool. I've got some eye infections going on and I've got stuff in my eyes. Although you when do, I however, up... look cool in the interim. So you do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying a little Steve McQueen. Kind that's of what, thank, you, thank you. That's what that's what Jennifer said. And that's what one of the admitting nurses at the hospital said yesterday when I went for my weekly injection. I said, I said, I said, I'm not trying to look cool. And she said, you are cool. You don't have to try to look cool, nice. <laughs> which cracked me up no end. Anyway, we have we have created um, and 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 Gil Meg will talk about this in her book. I don't know if you got there yet. We have created these um, emerging trends in the world <clears throat> that have led us kind of over the cliff. Um, you know, the capitalist trend, the environmental degradation um, trend, and, and these emergent trends are, you know, they are on vectors that I think from everything I've heard, I don't, I don't think we can we can turn around before there is some great level of degradation, destruction, collapse, right? So the question is, how can those of us, and I know so many people here are doing good work in the world, whether it is actually work on the ground as Klaus was doing or, or writing um, ourselves into, into the future. Um, and the question is, from my understanding, there's no coordinating body looking at all the, the different newly emerging trends and trying to put the pieces together. Um, Sharif Abdullah wrote a book um, in, in uh, around 1992 called Creating a World That Works for All. And one of the things that I always pull from that is everybody thinks they have the answer when in truth, everybody has a little piece of the answer. So how can we keep, how can we coordinate and keep all these balls bubbling and see which new emergent trends start to bubble up to the surface and create uh, major movements of some kind? Um that I think is 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 a little bit of the path that we're on. 
Um, the, the idea of being positive or negative, to me, it's just being um, positive in the work that you're called to do as an individual. Um, you know, we're, we all kind of know that we're going to go through some dark times a, a, as things get worse, maybe in our lifetimes, maybe not. Um, so that's all I wanted to say about that. Mr. Homer, at your own pace. With regard to the soil costs, I um, heard Michael Pollan give a lecture a few years ago here in Marin, and he's, you know, he drew the link between World War II and agriculture. Because uh, the end of World War II, you had these huge munitions factories and these, these big um, you know, uh, nerve gas factories. And it's like, hey, what are we gonna do? We gotta find a um, gotta find a way to, to make this work in peacetime. So munition, you know, fertilizers, uh, which came out of out of nerve gases, became what we started to apply in billions and billions of tons uh, to the land, poisoning it and destroying its its soil viability. And uh, munitions, um, uh, the same thing. It's like it just so the wartime economy shifted to agriculture. Think about that. We've got a war on agriculture. We're using what we learned how to how we learned to destroy people has been applied to the soil. That is the biggest self terminating. Um, experiment I can think of, along with the fact that we've released over 75,000 different chemicals into the environment, none of which have been tested for syn uh, synergistic effects, and only a handful of which have been tested for um, the effects on, on life. So we're in the middle of this huge chemical experiment and this this huge war on, on the soil and, and the land. Um, and, and that's the kind of stuff that not many people want to even consider, let alone start to think about deeply. So part of the challenge of many of the dark aspects. I don't, I don't, like, I don't like dark because the light and dark has a very weighted value sense to it. Darkness can be very fruitful and, and useful, but the, the the more horrific side of, of the poly crisis is that we're not paying attention to the fact that we're doing this to ourselves. We think that we're, we're actually, you know, fighting someone else, but it's, it's us in the long run. There is no others. There's just us. There's just whatever we do to the planet, we do to ourselves. So, you know, what does it look like to shift out of that as a as a worldview and find a worldview where we can create a world together because worlds are created through worldviews. So how do we collectively create a worldview that says we want to be here for the next 50 million years? Actually, I'd like I'd like 165 million. Dinosaurs were who is we, us humans, Gil? All of us humans in this sense. I'm talking about the big we. Yeah. Um Dinosaurs were, were on the planet for about 165, 170 million years. They had brains the size of peas. We have these big brains that we've been here less than 3 million years. We have to take ourselves out of the picture. Can we at least plan to live as long as the dinosaurs? And if so, what does that do to our, that long-term um, frame do to our thinking in the short term of how do we create a, a sustainable, viable, flourishing world where not just humans, but the more than human and greater than human world flourishes as well because if we apply ourselves to that we just might stand a chance i think anything less is going to be failure thank you um i think doug had his hand up a, a moment ago Stuart, if you if we can go doug then Stuart. perfect okay um it seems to me that talking negatively about the future disempowers some people and become hopeless and don't do anything but talking positively about the future has the same effect on a lot of people because they say, oh, see, it's being handled. We don't have to do anything. My be belief is that shocking hard facts motivate people who are capable of hard action uh, to, to become engaged. Uh, and that the story that we're in, which is the temperature is going up and we have no plan on how to stop it going up. Uh, and as it goes up, we're going to have more things like the Maui fire uh, from yesterday. Uh, so we're in a very complicated uh, conundrum in terms of how to speak. Because the negative doesn't work, the positive doesn't work. Uh, and what we need is a small number of people 
who are willing to take the hard facts straight on uh, and deal with them. Uh, and my view is that all the high probability scenarios uh, lead to trouble. Uh, we need low probability scenarios that we can believe in uh, and work for, but it's in the context of hard facts. Uh, I believe Garden World is the, the best intermediate solution possible uh, because people have to live in somewhere and eat somewhere. And that's what Garden World really does is try to put those together into something to work on. But if it's weakened by the fact that say, oh, see, uh, we've dealt with agriculture, uh, problem solved, uh, then we're in trouble. We need to keep looking at hard facts. Um, if I can interrupt for a second, just to follow uh, Doug. So I track extreme weather events in my brain, of course. I've got climate change will increase <clears throat> extreme weather events and hopefully concern. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then I have a thought, well, when will extreme climate events convince voters to act, for example? And then every year, so here's the year 2023, and here's extreme weather events of this year, many records broken. And there were so many records broken that I created another thought called 2023 is looking more extreme than usual, tipping soon. And July was the world's hottest month and uh, uncharted territory past the tipping point this century, Antarctic sea ice levels, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not noticing, this is just me, I'm not noticing uh, the people who have their hands on the levers of power making any particularly different decisions based on these kinds of things that seem really shocking. And there's there's a there's an abundance of good writing on the topic. A bunch of, uh, there's an abundance of people who are like, hey, everybody, trying to shake civilization by its lapels, giving us really scary information. So, so Doug, what level of scary works for whom delivered in what method do you think? Well, I think we should just take the hard facts that, that, that we can and look at the logic. I mean, if temperature is going up because CO2 is still going up and there's no plan to cut it, no actual plan uh, that's operational, then we're in deep trouble. And what it should do is get our imagination going. So here's a species that sucked itself into a bad place trying to live off of carbon that's under the ground. What the fuck do we do to get out of this? This is really difficult. We need a different form of government. We need different forms of technology, uh, different ways of relating to the land. Uh, it's a problem of imagination. And the, the adequate, tough imagination will only get released if we face the hardest facts that, that seem to be in the face of us. Um, thank you. Let's go Stuart Gill and come back into this issue, I think. And I, I, I'll remind me to talk about uh, Freeman Dyson when we come back. So, yeah. Stuart. Yeah. And the simple hard fact is that where we are is not working. Um, it's just not working. At, at so many different, you know, places, you know, Doug, like you, I, I, you call it Garden World. I call it uh, my Heaven on Earth, uh, international political party, kind of like Workers of the World Unite. Who wants to see Heaven on Earth? Um, not in your lifetime, but think about, you know, seven, seven generations out. Um, how can we reorganize? Um, and and I, I love the way you said it, a species that's boxed itself um, into a corner. Um, just a little aside, Ken, as you were talking before about, you know, using chemicals from, from wartime, one of the drugs that I'm actually taking, anti-cancer drugs, is called um, Revolimid. And essentially what it is, anybody remember thalidomide? Um, it's, it's thalidomide <laughs> repurposed wow. because there is... There is, you know, if you're if you're um, a, a woman capable of being pregnant, don't take this drug. If you're a guy having relationships with a woman of of childbearing age, um, you, you can't do that. Um, so it's an interesting phenomenon in terms of repurposing um, things invented in, in war. But I don't want to end that on that note. Optimistic and pessimistic, it's all quite cyclical. So what looks really bad today 
could look really different or good tomorrow. It's you know what goes down comes up, what goes up comes down. Um, how can we we create a little bit of a of a different trend um, today in terms of moving onto the up cycle from the from the place at the bottom of the trough um, or heading to the bottom of the trough? We haven't gotten there yet. How can we how can we move it into something? That's why when I when I try to wrap my arms around this and and think about actions that are being taken, I think about um, parallel process in the sense of um, are we planning to avoid the collapse, the full and complete collapse, the the level of dystopia, um, whatever that might look like, or are we planning for something? after the collapse to rebuild um, the species. Um, thank you, Doug. Yeah, thanks, Not sir. Doug, Gil. Gil. Mm -hmm. Gil, the floor is yours. I know, I'm pausing. OK, good. Oh, thank you. Following That's the protocol, Chair. Very kind of you. Yeah, doing my best. Um, this is a challenging conversation to follow. It's very hippity hoppity. Um, it's about a couple of thoughts. Um, Stuart, your, your, your opening statement about, I don't have your exact words, we're really fucked, that's the fact. It's not a fact, it's an assessment. It's an interpretation of data that you're turning into, you know, in, in, into a statement, but that's not a fact. And we need to be really clear on what are facts and what are not. Um, Doug, I completely agree with you that we have to face reality and that we have to look at the hard facts. And that's really critical to, you know, to orienting people to what we face and what we need to do. Um, you know, if you're the pilot of an airliner and you lose a, and you lose an engine, you can't pretend that you haven't lost the engine. Um, but when you say there's no plan, which you say pretty regularly, um, I want to invite you to say something that might be more accurate, which is that there's no plan being implemented effectively at the scale that we need. We have lots of plans. We know what to do. The science is clear. The strategies are clear. The technologies are clear. A lot is in motion. None of it is, ad is adequate. None of it's at adequate scale or penetration. Uh, and the opposition to doing sensible things is huge and extremely well-funded. But, you know, but we don't have a plan, I think, is not the most powerful message that you're trying to offer. Um, so my suggestion to you, you said also we need a small group that will do what's necessary. So it sounds like you have a plan. <laughs> so we'd be good to know what that is. Um, I don't know any plan that has a small group solving the poly crisis. So maybe there's that to talk about. But on the optimism pessimism thing, it's like, you know, we need realism. We need to face what's so. Um, we, uh, you know, people are motivated in different ways. Some people are motivated, motivated by fear and resentment and anger, and some are motivated by hope and possibility and ambition. Uh, in my experience, um, <clears throat> the bad news is never enough. Um, some sense of what could be different, of what could be, of what it's worth investing in and risking for seems to be a necessary part of the mix. And we can, you know, we can all of us roll out, all, you know, examples on both sides from from history to support that, but that's how I tend to see it. Uh, Doug, you also talked about a problem of imagination, and that's exactly where I think a lot of people have been talking about is imagining the world we want. Like, why couldn't it be that way? Oh, look, here's examples, small scale in different places of where it is kind of like that way. Ah, existence is proof of the possible. If it's there, maybe it could be in more places. And so imagination, I think, is as important as facing the the so-called hard facts at least for me in the way that i orient in the game so thank you thanks Gil. i'm gonna pause for a moment before i jump in So this is a, a swirl of a conversation on lots of different things, and it feels like it's kind of a meat and potatoes topic for Gil, for Klaus, for Doug, like we're sort of in the heart of what you care about really deeply and have spent a, a lot of your life energy working on. And I love that. And I wish we had simpler things. 
Um, I just want to reflect that um, I, I talked to Esther last week, which interrupted my presence on our call. It was really interesting uh, because that got me interested in her dad a bit. And I, over the last couple of days, I watched a couple of clips of Freeman Dyson being interviewed about a bunch of different topics, which were really interesting. And I got to meet him because he would regularly attend PC Forum uh, and he would be there, you know, a little before and around and, and so forth. And he's just a, uh, in, uh, he's a controversial and elegant thinker. Mm. And, and he has been seen as a climate denialist because he doesn't agree with all of the arguments that people are making around what to, what to measure, what to do. Um, and I think one of his critiques is about CO2, and I'm not sure. And, and I think you get what you measure. And I'm, I'm interested in this because of the solutions. And, and Gil, you just said that the solutions are very clear. And I'm, I'm not so clear that they're really clear. I think they're plentiful. I think there are, there are plan, ab abundant plans for what to do, uh, not that much agreement necessarily on which, which priorities and what where. And the focus on CO2, which has risen above most other things that we might do, has led to things like cap and trade and carbon credit markets and basically the capital capitalismization of a gigantic social eco ecological problem that hasn't really worked. I would say that that buying carbon credits or, or that kind of thing is like a head fake that makes people think like something is happening, but I don't know that it's actually contributed in any way toward fixing things in the world. And a focus on soil fertility, for example, like soil organic matter, and I'm an amateur saying, hey, that would be an interesting measure that you could actually sort of measure with satellites and with a probe of some sort. Um, would be very different from that and might lead to actually functional improvements in community health all the way up to atmospheric conditions. I don't know. But I think I think what we measure and what measures we we raise as, uh, you know, it's like net promoter score became this simple metric for company viability and, and good. Uh, and the, it's the answer to one question, which is, would you recommend this product or service to a friend? And that that is NPS. And that is the result of a bunch of other research on uh, Frederick Reichheld at Bain did a bunch of research on, on uh, churn. All of this kind of led to NPS, which was uh, our Western minds attempt to let's boil everything down to one number we can score on. And it's not that helpful. And I hate getting the NPS surveys because I'm like, hey, I want to tell you, I want to speak to you and tell you that your user experience was miserable. I just I just flew to Geneva and back on Condor. And the moment April was like, oh, you're flying on Condor? Her brow furrowed. And I'm like, yeah, it was the best price for what I was looking for and the best schedule. And it turns out that the flights were just fine. The user experience before, after, and around it was miserable. It was like dumb. Like they like it intentionally forgotten how to do customer service and how to treat people well and how to remove doubt and all that kind of thing. So I'm I'm bumping several layers around, but I'm concerned about how we focus on what to do. And my faith is in distributed efforts and distributed overlapping resonant plans or goals that actually together aggregate up into large movements of behavior and outcomes. And I'm a, and and I think that's entirely doable. And I don't know that we're going to end up converging on the one best plan that's going to solve this problem. And we're all going to just fix it and do that same thing. And I fear that when that when single plans show up in single metrics, everybody tries to game the system. I've forgotten. There's there's some kind of principle of of everybody tries to game the system. There's a, a theorem about that. Uh, anyway, that, that's my my general thought on that. I'll, with that, I will pass to Klaus. Probably mistake here. Um, yeah, I agree there is no such thing as one best plan, but I do believe there is such thing as a one best process. And in the process that 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 I that I think uh, will prevail is to decentralize and localize. And, and so, and, and the reason I'm saying this is that each community has unique conditions. Uh, you have, I mean, in my food world, you have unique soils, you have unique climates, access to water, and what so far everyone wants to ignore socioeconomics. You can't change the damn thing. 
without addressing the socioeconomic impacts of these changes, right? And those are different in Eugene, Oregon, than they're in Bend, Oregon, or in Kansas, you know, because you're dealing with different population groups, different realities, uh, you know, the people mixes, and what have you. Um, and so, and so that's really that's really the important part. Now, I, I'm actually having a networking meeting uh, later today, where the Kiss the Ground Group and Regenerate America have you know, issued. We need to focus on farmers markets and on CSAs to boost local food systems. And I'm poking you know, a hole into this bubble because. Farmers markets and CSAs constitute three percent of market. So what are you going to do? Double it? You know, it's just nonsense. It can't scale. So in order to scale change, you have to engage the business sector. That means you you have to get to go to your local Kroger store and Walmart store and say, can you help us to launch these farmers? We need to source local. Right? Can you help us spawn some of these small businesses? that you have so successfully destroyed over the last decades. <laughs> so the, 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 there, is a, there is a change where companies you know, that want to succeed long term have to find ways to stay global, but act local, so to speak. They have to change their, their process for the aggregation practices, their sourcing practices, their processing practices, recipes, menus, in order to accommodate local and regional, you know, bioregion kind of uh, uh, idiosyncrasies that that just need to be uh, uh, strengthened and put in place. So, so I think that you know, the and and when people act local and in in their own interest, you know, then they hold each other accountable, you know, because that's within our own sphere. Of of what we what we the 150 people or so groups that we can that we can function within, right? So 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 that's that's the the only thing I can think of is to regionalize, not decentralize, but keep macro structures on top of that because there is no there is no sense decentralizing tools and you know uh, uh, IT support systems and all of this that should stay. Uh, but then in but then be made available in modular form to a community to a region so they can customize it thanks Cost. i think that that gets at something really important um and i would build on that and say that that in addition to working locally we have to pay attention to the people who are local and include those whose voices have been traditionally marginalized women people of color poor people um because if we're going to build a system that works it can't be top down it's got to emerge out of a uh, collective uh process and you know in his book community the structure of belonging peter block says look there's all kinds of amazingly great processes out there that can bring people together who are have diverse and and sometimes opposing positions and through skillful facilitation they can actually arrive at a, an agreed upon plan but for the most part these processes are closely held by you know uh, a cadre of facilitators who are trying to make money off them and they're not actually sharing them very widely so i think um another piece of the puzzle is we need really good local facilitation to bring together people to talk about tough issues and do it in a structured way where they can begin to make much better decisions because we resort to, you know, we're in pain, we need to make a decision, let's just jump. This this person has something, okay, we'll go with that and we're going to impose it from top down. That doesn't work at all. Um, not, was it last month, Gil? We did, no, two months ago, we Gil and I host this Living Between Worlds call on the third Wednesday of each month, which is next Wednesday. Please join us uh, noon, um, noon, noon to 1.30. And the topic was, what if you had to change? What if, you know, you didn't want to, but you had to change? And he, we gave the example of World War II, where, you know, the auto industry came to FDR after Pearl Harbor and said, you know, here's our plan to retool over the next few months. And FDR said, no, today, you start today. There is no waiting. We changed today and we reoriented the entire uh, economy of the United States to a wartime economy. Now, at the time, that wasn't hard to do because of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. So there wasn't this huge industry saying, no 
the attack was staged. It didn't really happen. It's not really going on. There wasn't as big de denial industry. We have to confront that. We've got a denial industry that says your problems aren't that bad. But there, there are precedents for when economies have shifted, mostly due to war. I'm reading a book right now on, on how economists invented um, austerity uh, to regain control after World War I, after the Great War in, in Italy and Britain, where thanks to the fact that they tried laissez-faire capitalism to, uh, to use the invisible hand of the market to create the best outcomes, but it became far more profitable for ship owners to sell British ships um, to competitors and pocket the money than to take care of their country. So we have to, again, remember how people operate when you're in a capitalist system with a profit motive. The profit motive feeds human greed, and human greed is a terrible way to organize your society. <laughs> Just We're looking at that right now. So can we have some different ways of, of doing this? Um, so I don't know where I'm going with this. Just I want to mention, you know, when it comes to change, and Gil and I are talking about this, a lot of people talk about you need a theory of change. We only have a theory of change. Change happens in lots of different ways and lots, you know, it's local everywhere. But change does happen. And there are tipping points. And there are things that will move people and, and motivate them. I don't <laughs> think it's necessarily facts. Um, you know, my father used to say, don't confuse me with the facts. My mind's made up. George Lakoff has a whole book on this, you know, of what happens when your facts conflict, conflict with my, my frame. But if you can convince people this goes to Stephen Covey's you know people don't want to know how much uh you care until they know you care right they don't know they don't know how much you know they want they care about do you care about them so we've got to demonstrate care for the people who've been marginalized that's going to bring about an enormous influx of creativity um and I would love to see Mike maybe you can you know exercise something in Washington to help get more funding for large-scale public participation in really naughty problems where good facilitation is is the norm and it's it's paid for and it, it can start to spread out because i don't think any group of experts is going to come up with what's necessary they'll come up with all kinds of plans they've been doing that for years but um thanks mike <laughs> maybe 36 will be the, the 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 key um so you know we we've got to uh we've got to change our approach and be much more willing to listen to people who we think um, are not necessarily those who have the answers because the answers are going to come from multiple places. I heard Michael Mead read second coming. And I said, if, if the, if the center won't hold, you know, where do you look? He says, look to the margins. The margins is where all the creativity is. We need the margins will come into the center when the center falls apart, which margin will it be is the question. End of rant. Thank you. Well, the rant, I think, is a perfect um, tie in and bridge um, for the organizational structure that class articulated. Um, and the idea of um, massive worldview shift. How can we move the mindset of huge segments of the population out of the capitalist mindset and into something different? It's a conundrum. <laughs> and I, I think the best, you know, pointing towards it is what happens in, in wartime when everyone is faced with the same kind of um, potential calamity. Um, and, I, and I've said a number of times on this call, you know, there hasn't been enough pain on behalf of enough people yet to actually create a tipping point um, at which more and more and more and more and more people um, are going to wake up or the metaphor from the old mediation world ah they haven't had enough pain yet to be ready to really sit down and, and resolve the situation so that they can leave it behind um that to me seems to be the <clears throat> the just the essential fulcrum that we keep looking to and and dancing around how do you how do you change uh mindsets in a massive way 
um, where people are not skeptical <clears throat> because it's not about um, one person's profit motive. Um, <laughs> the question comes up, how did Jesus do it? Because <laughs> that's where we seem to be at a moment, you know, no pun intended, especially for the Christians in the in 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 the call. Um, <laughs> we're at a come to Jesus moment. <laughs> and here we are. Mm -hmm. Plus, uh, you're muted. Uh, if I may you know, pick up on this come to Jesus moment. I mean, actually, when you look at the New Testament, it really is a great um, a strat a strategic outline on how to fight you know, in, a social, in a social change environment. Uh, I, I mean, you, you can, you can the, the, the entire, the entire um, uh, philosophy embedded here, you know, the, uh, the uh, servant leadership uh, uh, principle. You know, if you're, if you're really in a, in a scenario where you desperately need change, you, you become a servant leader because you want to, <laughs> you want to help, right? And it's not about you leading, it's about you guiding, you know, with your ability to do that. And there, there are so many fantastic uh, ideas embedded in there, but it's just all sort of washed and misconstrued in the way that we are interpreting uh, this as a religion. You know? But anyway, I saw it come to Jesus moment. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we are nearing the end of our normal allotted period. I am curious about Mr. Homer and whether he is carrying the of words course. in sequence for us. Uh, and if he would perhaps take the floor and share said words with us. I prefer I come to Buddha moment myself. Yes. I was just thinking there. WWBD. Yeah. Um. <laughs> or Muhammad, or whatever prophet you choose to be following. Uh, no, I, I actually choose Buddha because he was a man, not a god. And that's important to me. Mm -hmm. but it's, it's reported that when the Buddha achieved his enlightenment, the first people he saw were two children. And they looked at him and said, are you a god? He said, no. And they said, you know, are, are you uh, uh, an angel? And he said, no. And they said, well, what are you? He says, awake. <laughs> so that's my Buddhist approach. Um, I, don't, I don't need deities. I just need awake people. Does the pun work so, in Sanskrit? Say again? Does the pun work in Sanskrit? <laughs> I don't know. But uh, speaking of, of being awake, here's a little poem from Antonio Machado called Is My Soul Asleep? Hmm. Is my soul asleep? Have those beehives that work in the night stopped? On the water wheel of thought, is it going around now, cups empty, carrying only shadows? No, my soul is not asleep. It's awake, wide awake. It neither sleeps nor dreams, but watches. Its eyes wide open, far off things and listens at the shores of the great silence. Thank you, Ken. Has anybody else become addicted to YouTube shorts of beekeepers who are rescuing the bees? The Texas beekeeper, I think, is her handle. It's just amazing. It, like YouTube shorts are one minute, and she's got a, a micro drama in a minute of I got, I found this hive. This is what happened. And she goes in without gear and scoops up bees and moves them to a new container and finds, the, can you identify the queen and clips the queen in a little queen holder and, and talks about like what's going on. She's totally a bee whisperer. And I find it completely captivating. Mm. Um, and then I think, I think the way it works is everybody's susceptible to being addicted to YouTube shorts or TikToks or whatever, but everybody's addiction is different but right exactly. now i'm on first person roller coaster views i don't know why 
Oh, <laughs> love that. <laughs> Speaking uh, of uh, Texas, I, I did read a story yesterday, I think it was in the New York Times, of a woman who was doing some yard work and a snake fell out of the sky and wrapped it against, wrapped around her arm and began to attack her face. And then she's screaming and flying around and her husband's running to her and a hawk comes down out of the sky and rips the snake off her arm and tears the hell out of her arm in the process. And it's like, I'm surprised it didn't happen in Florida, actually, but it's a good reason for me not to go to Texas. <laughs> wow. What happens um, when you get in the middle of an ecosystem? Exactly. <laughs> we, we, did, uh, we did a one-day trip into Ngorongoro Crater as our, the only safari I've ever been on. And uh, at lunch, you, you pull up to like near a watering hole and they're like, beware of the birds. Like, don't, don't eat lunch outside. Eat lunch in, in the car. And we, we, we do that. And then we go up on the roof and look around. There's all kinds of wildlife around. It's really cool. And then we look at the, 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 the Jeep or the truck next door where there's a lady who's like putting her lunch out. And a bird just like strikes, just like wham. And she just shouts and jumps. It's really quite amusing. Uh, Pete, to feed your, your roller coaster, Jones, uh, one of my favorite music videos, it's not the view forward. It's a view of a passenger in a roller coaster, but it's a beautiful song as well. Uh, so thank you that for you um, and any last words from anybody else uh, Gil yeah I was struck when Ken was talking about the conversation about what if we had to and the really astute observation I, I often use the World War II transformation example and Ken you know wisely pointed out that there wasn't consolidated organized highly funded opposition like there is now but I also think about the personal example of someone gets, you know, someone gets a medical diagnosis, their kid is going to die unless they do something. Most people will turn their lives around to save their children or get a cancer diagnosis or whatever will turn their lives around. This was this is what motivated Carl Henrik Robert to found the natural step as an oncologist. He found parents that would do anything they could possibly do to save their kids' lives, except change their lifestyle that was contributing to the environmental toxins, et cetera, that were creating the cancers. Wow, but but I'm struck that you know as I say the phrase that people will will transform their lives to save their lives. Not everybody does that. Some people don't stop smoking, or don't do whatever it is the doctor says you must do this or you will be dead within 12 months, and that may be an interesting place to investigate. Uh, you know, because it's it's very clear, very direct, very personal, very concrete, not abstract. You know. Uh, you will die unless you do these things. And who does those things and who doesn't? And what and why? Maybe there's a, a seed of something to investigate and understand there. Robert Keegan and Lisa Leahy wrote a book called The Immunity to Change that deals exactly with this. They begin by saying people who have been diagnosed with heart disease and are told if you don't make lifestyle changes, you'll die. A very small percentage of them make the changes. And so they're like, why is that? And mm. their their take is that we have competing commitments so you know um i i know i need to change but i'm also committed to other things that get in the way of that change so we have to start examining our commitments and we have to start examining what's the assumptions underneath that if we make that change that's Good ken thank you i'm going to check that one out the other the other the complementarity to the immunity to change is that one of the things that capitalism is is masterful at is change without change which is to say a distinction about which things it's committed to and which things are completely up for grabs, happy to change all that stuff, won't change this core. Uh, so, yeah. Could we use the audio, indus auto industry as an example? Because I'm not seeing any, any, you know, there's a lot of foot dragging on. We're going to, and we're just going to switch to electric cars. Well, we don't have the resources to do that. We're never going to create a, 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 you know, 5 billion electric cars. It's not going to happen. You know, Al Gore just gave a TED talk um, uh, that was really powerful because he put, uh, I mean, he talked about uh, the COP28, you know, and the Abu Dhabi leader, the uh, uh, head of the CEO of an oil company leading it, <clears throat> and how, uh, I, 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 it's too late to dig it up, but if you go look it up, and, and he's really going after the industries. Uh, Purposefully, purposefully confusing the issues and putting up these pseudo carbon capture nonsense projects uh, to basically distract and continue their work. Yeah, and Shell, which has been a, a leader in climate change in the fossil industry for decades, has just retrenched back into the fold 
Yeah. 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 So I was in a conversation with a very yeah. smart person the other day who said, Ken, like, kind of like you did, said, we're, there's no way we're going to convert everything to electric cars. Yeah. And there's no way we're going to get China and Africa to not build air conditioners. And my thought was, well, yeah, but those are the those are the wrong questions and binary solutions to the wrong questions. I'd rather think about how do we build cities that don't require cars? Uh, how do we build buildings that don't require air conditioning, even in hot climates? We know how to do those things. Right. So it's, you know, which question do you ask? Is it replacing the existing infrastructure so existing oil and car companies continue to make their profits or do we transform into something else? And that's the tough one. 30, 35 years ago, Gil, um, one of your heroes, Fernando Flores actually said that, and he was prescient, I think, there will be radical discontinuity. And by that, he meant that some people would go through a mindset shift and many won't. And, and the imagery that that evoked for me was just kind of people kind of um, not getting on the train, not getting on the, on, on the mountain, just uh, being left behind as some new order, you know, percolates. Radical discontinuity. Mm -hmm. And on that cheery note. Exactly. <laughs> um, thank you very much for chasing the pearl uh, together. I really appreciate it. It turns out the pearl represents chi, a thing I did not know and was quite interesting. As long as we're not chasing the dragon. Exactly. And we all wish Stuart happy healing or at least yes. wrap. <laughs> I think I'm going to be cool for a while, Mike. <laughs> I can't wait to see you in your jet fighter. <laughs> stay, stay, stay cool, Stuart. Stay cool. <laughs> don't, don't be trying to ride a motorcycle off a ramp off a cliff to do those squirrels. Okay? <laughs> don't, don't worry. Speaking, <laughs> speaking of short YouTube videos, there's a whole class from this about Tom Cruise and his gung ho, you know, do all the stunts myself stuff. So yeah. if you don't have enough, if you don't have enough time on your hands. Yeah, exactly. I, I actually sold my motorcycle about a month ago. Oh, <laughs> yeah. It was a smart thing to do. <laughs> well, thank you all. Uh, be well and see you in a week's time. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Uh...